Hello everyone, we have felt your pain and have decided to bring you some relief in the form of this 45 minute chat with two of Adelaide's people of interest. We're helping to keep the local scene afloat. Otto and I thought we'd give this a go since uh, everyone who does it seems to have a hell of a lot of fun. So please enjoy. All right, jumping right into it. Um, we've got two lovely guests with us on the pilot of the Australian Underground podcast. We've got Ed from Sunnyside Uploads joining us very shortly. Um, but first up, we've got Kim Roberts. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? What sort of creative ventures are you a part of? Sure thing. Thanks so much for having me along today. Um, yeah, I am pretty busy. I do a whole bunch of different things. Um, my day job, I work at Music SA as head of training. Um, Music SA is the state peak music industry body. We're a non-government, not-for-profit. Um, so we work pretty hard to do as much as we can for the local community and support people as much as we can. Um, and in my role of head of training, I run the um, Cert 3 in music industry with a performance specialty. And I'm in the process of putting together a bunch of um, short courses for musicians as well. So lots of um, insider tips and tricks and uh, how the music industry works, um, you know, how to manage your copyright, how to look after your income streams and protect your um, creative rights, all those kinds of things. And uh, I also, outside of that, volunteer for 3D Radio. I've been there for nearly 10 years now. Um, I host a show every week called Audio Origami. And uh, I try and play as much new local music as possible. So my show is almost all Australian, almost all new and a big old chunk of local stuff too, because it is damn fine and I love it. Um, and aside from that, I'm in a couple of bands as well. So uh, that all definitely keeps me very busy. <laughs> wow. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> most of my evenings are full. <laughs> You know, I thought I thought I was a little bit busy, um, but that's nothing in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Um, now, now, Kim, I have I have met you briefly, very briefly, before uh, when I popped into the uh, into the music essay offices, um, saying good day yes. to to Tom Gordon while I was there. Um, yeah, I remember you came in for a meeting. Yeah. Uh, very very briefly, um, but I have seen you. I've seen you play before. Um, on stage, obviously, in in last days of last days of Carly, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, are, are you involved in any other uh, musical ventures? Yeah. So last days of Carly, we've been going since oh, I don't know, 2012, 2013, or something, which is a long time. Um, I didn't quite realise until recently when I saw the date on some old demos, and I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that they're an instrumental post rock band. I like making a big old racket with guitar. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I've also got a new band called Placement with a bunch of mates. I'm on bass this time. It's sort of uh, post punky kind of vibes. Um, doing a little bit of backup vocals this time too, which is um, yeah something I haven't done. I haven't sung in quite some time, so that's a bit terrifying, but also really fun. <laughs> Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> um, now, now we'll reiterate this when, when Ed joins, but uh, we want the kind of overarching theme of, of just this uh, short podcast series we're doing to be just how people are coping during all this, how people are adapting, uh, and mm -hmm. most, most importantly, the future of the industry. Like, where are we going to go from here? It's, it's pretty clear that we won't have full live gigs, um, maybe for the end uh, until the end of the year. Um, so that's, that's worrying also for a lot of bands who make their income off that. Um, obviously streaming from home is great, but it, it it's, doesn't pay the bills. Um, you can put a donation button there, but it's never nearly going to be um, as much as door sales would be. Um, so I guess, yeah, so that, that's why I wanted to bring you on as someone who obviously works at 3D, you're sort of the voice for the community. Um, you probably hear a lot as well as what, what people's thoughts are, um, you know, their opinions and everything. Um, uh, yeah, as someone who hears a lot from the community, what, what is the, the general vibe, uh, I guess, going forward from here? 
Um, yeah, it's definitely been a difficult time while people try and adjust. You know, we've heard the term bandied around a lot, new normal. Um, yeah, it's, it is difficult, particularly when the restrictions were quite tough to even know um, how to go about things like rehearsals. Um, you know, it's obvious that we haven't been able to perform, but even recording, how do we make it work in that environment? So it's been really interesting to see some of the creative ventures that, you know, in creative ways that people have been getting around this. Um, I've seen a lot of collaborations of flicking demos backwards and forwards in between people, um, you know, using things like Dropbox and um, collaborating remotely, which I think is really cool. Um, of course, live streaming, which I'm sure Ed can talk to, um, has has definitely been a way of being able to perform in this environment. And yeah, you know, a, a donate button, like you said, is, is not really a substitute for, um, you know, or fees at this point, but um, it's still a valid way of communicating with people and growing your audience and um, performing in this difficult environment. Um, not to forget as well that APRA AMCOS, who are Australia's royalty collection agency, are also accepting um, live performance returns from live streamed um, live streamed events under certain circumstances. So you still can actually get some royalty income from those um, streaming performances as well, which is an, an additional revenue stream that's definitely not to be sniffed at. Mm. Is, that, is that sustainable? Sustainable, that's a really tough call. Um, I think it's just one technique that we can use in combination with a bunch of other things. Um, I think recording is um, is still an important thing to do um, and to try and think of ways because Spotify is great and we can get some money from that, unlike streaming through some other platforms where you don't actually get money. Um, but at the same time, it's not a lot. So I think we might see a few more download sales starting to be pushed again. Okay. Um, I also think that things like merch are also um, important to do. Um, and I've also seen a few people, you know, start to get a bit creative in how they can um, collaborate with their listeners during this time as well. I've seen some sort of fun things, you know, people putting stems up and asking for people to do remixes and um inviting other people into the creative process which sort of does foster that sense of community and creativity and loyalty as well which hopefully will continue on after all of this is faded away so okay so there's so there's some positives on the horizon then so it's not all bleak and grim no, I don't think it's all bleak and grim at all. I think um, the introduction of some technologies has sort of forced our hand to rethink you know, the traditional way that we've done things and think about some extra things that we can do to bring into our creative practice and the way we communicate our music with people. Um, yeah, it's certainly been a tough time. I actually looked up some figures before this. Um, there's this website called I Lost My Gig, where you can report lost income from music performances. The latest tally nationally is $340 million oh. um, of lost income <laughs> during COVID. Um, wow. So, yeah, it's definitely hit hard. Um, but I think, if anything, it's shown to me that artists themselves are really resilient and adaptable and creative and can think of some really cool ways of still being able to do what we love doing best even though it's quite kind of difficult i think one of the big challenges for the industry is going to be um, venue and event staff because you know that doesn't translate as easily into this sort of virtual space so um I think we've still got a way to go and we've still got some challenges to overcome. Um, a few music businesses um, have gone into receivership. Um, a few venues before uh, have you know, been a little bit vocal um, online about you know, struggling if this continued um, without yeah, yeah, some support. Yeah, pop up. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So there's definitely still some challenges to overcome. Um, but I don't think it's all doom and gloom. And I also think too that while things are starting up again, like we're definitely not going to have international touring. I'd be very surprised if we had international touring this year. Um, but I actually think that's a really good chance for um, us to sort of seize the opportunity to really champion local content and champion Australian artists and champion local artists um, and really put our local scene front and centre um, while we can't bring other people over here because <laughs> we've got plenty of amazing talent here. Um, yeah, I go to shows when pre-COVID, I went to shows pretty much every week, sometimes more than once a week. And it always astounds me, the diversity and the, you know, amazingness of the stuff that we've got going on here so i reckon it's a good chance to start to show showcase some of that and really put it front and center in a wider audience definitely kim you have filled me with both of them <laughs> oh i'm so glad <laughs> I do. Um, yeah you, you, yeah you look, that's good points yeah go, go ahead Oliver. it's very evident of um how both listeners and artists have sort of adapted their practices when, you know, consuming music and how they're making a living. What about the industry, especially with your, you know, ties in radio? How do you see that going moving forward? Yeah, well, radio is a really interesting one because you would think with streaming services that radio, particularly things like community radio, because it is an expensive business, um, there's a lot of overheads to maintain and a lot of equipment and all of that kind of thing. You think that it would actually be declining due to the rise of things like Spotify, but um, there's a um, Community Broadcasting Association of Australia. Um, they're called CBAA for short. Um, they, I guess, help um, keep track and uh, I guess they're sort of the peak body for community radio in Australia. And their latest stats showed that 6 million Australians tune in to community radio every week. Oh, my God. That's hell yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a lot. lot. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually increasing, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. Um, so one of the main reasons their study showed that people wanted to tune in to community radio is to hear local voices and local stories and what's happening in their community, the artists that are in their community, and that sense of connection with people that are actually in your community and you're seeing that sense of curation and the stories that are attached that you can, that are just not easily you know, translated through something like a curated playlist on Spotify. So I thought that was really interesting. I think that's so wonderful. Um, you've really put a smile on my face there. I think it's so lovely that, you know, people have found their sense of community and their sense of um, connection and found that through Hello. community radio. Hey, Ed's just joined us. Um, hey, young. Hey, we're Ed. Well. Ed is in his Ed. car. Really? I need to record my audio, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, if you can, that'd be great. It says I need to request record permission from the meeting host. Uh, I think Jordan's got us all recorded. Yeah, um, yeah that should be. So it should be fine. Yeah, it should be fine. Um, yeah. Um, but Ed, would you care to introduce yourself? Tell us about what sort of creative ventures you are. <laughs> going through which one uh, so yeah my um well my name is ed noble and i'm one of the founders of uh, sunnyside uploads which was a sort of you know birthed out of the chaos of coronavirus and all the pubs getting shut and everyone's gigs getting cancelled um it, i read the original concept came from josh who's on the team who just thought hey what if i just stream some stuff from my house like a lot of people thought but um, he already had a few cameras and he very quickly learned about switching and using OBS and streaming, you know, at a more polished up professional level. Um, and then, uh, we, you know, me, Josh and uh, Timothy, who's involved, we're all in the band Ghost Thief together. So we already work together well. And then Ben Galotta, um, who owns Repeater Productions, uh, he does a lot of film stuff. He, he knew Josh, met him at a few parties 
and just sort of hit him up and said, Hey man, I want on board. And having him on board with all of his experience was really valuable as well. So it was just this team of creative, you know, uh, hardworking people that just kind of fell together and everything happened really, really quickly. And we started booking gigs. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, um, and I'm super excited. Um, Ed, we, we share some band mates. Um, oh, some of my yeah. no <laughs> there we Sorry, go. Adelaide. We haven't actually met yet. I was going to meet you next yeah. week, I think, right? On, are you guys applying? Yeah, we are. We're, we're doing awesome. a sunny side. So I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, one of the lucky ones. We're starting to really get the hang of it now as well. So like the sort of production level just keeps growing, which is really nice to see. I've, I've been regularly watching them. I'm very much enjoying thanks. it indeed. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, speaking of Sunnyside, the song that's yes. sort of come into that whole live streaming game, you know, a bit later than everyone else, you've taken off a lot of traction really fast. Um, yeah, do you have any ideas was... on how you accomplished that? Man, I don't know. We just wanted to make it as good a product as we possibly could. And that's about it. I mean, we all, all of us have been involved in the music scene in some way or form for quite a while. And um, I guess it was just attention to details that got us over the line. We just wanted to make something that was as close to the real thing as possible. There was all these brands happened. We ended up just focusing purely on making it as high quality as possible. And I guess that's what did it, I, I suppose, yeah. Um, I was just about Absolutely. to yeah. I was just about to introduce um, Kim to Ed, but of course Adelaide is so small. You guys already knew each other. Just one degree <laughs> of separation. <laughs> um, Classic Adelaide. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, now, now Ed, the the kind of theme for this little uh, podcast series we're doing is is just mm. seeing how people are coping during all this and, yep. and thoughts on the future of the industry. Like, where are we going to go from here? Um, we've already chatted a little bit about this with Kim, um, but obviously, obviously you're already at the forefront with this whole streaming. Um, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You are, you're, you're keeping, you're very much keeping the scene alive. Um, people can't go out and see their favorite bands. So they tune into Sunnyside and, and then yeah. they to see them. Um, and I believe you guys, uh, you record all your shows at the Jade. Is that right? Yes, it's at the Jade. And I've, me, and, uh, me and Josh especially have had like a really, Josh more so, um, has had a really close relationship with the Jade. And when it used to be the Jade Monkey back on Twin Street back in the day, um, before they got moved out by the Ibis car park, uh, like we've known the owner. Yeah, right? We, I, like the owner of the Jade, um, he, he gave me my first gig when I was like 15. And I've been you know, gigging ever since. And me and Josh used to be in a band together way back when we were in high school. Um, it's Zach, the owner, by the way. And uh, Josh actually works there. He ended up getting a job at the New Jade and now he's the, the bar manager. And uh, Zach's just, uh, I don't know if you saw the Sea Thieves um, show that he did with us because that's his act is the Sea Thieves. And we didn't put him on just because he was the owner. Like it was an amazing act. And he, if you're talking about how people are dealing with it, uh, he's a prime example. Like he was chipper as, and he more so, almost more so than musicians for a lot of us. I mean, a, a lot of musicians, like some people do it as their main source of income. And for them, it's been really, really tough. But for a lot of us, it's, it's a side hustle. For Zach, it's his complete livelihood. The bar was closed. There was no gigs, nothing. And he was chipper. Like he was like, oh yeah, this is great. I get to see my kids a bit more. You know, it's a bit tough, but whatever. And like, it's just, it was fantastic just how cool he was about it all. And he was just happy for us to, Josh hit him up and said, hey man, can we set up and like try have a go at filming some bands? And he was just like, yeah, dude, take the keys, do whatever. Like, so it's been really cool. Yeah, and um, Zach and the team at the Jade are awesome. Um, two of my bands have played their first shows ever at either, yeah. or actually the old version of the Jade. The Jade Monkey. Yeah, yep. <laughs> same <laughs> <laughs> i remember i went in there on my 18th birthday and i came up to zach because i've been playing there for a while and i came up to zach and i'm just like hey dude it's my birthday can i have a beer can you can I have a beer on the house and he's just like yeah man how old are you 
I'm like, oh, it's my 18th. And he's like, you son of a bitch. You've been drinking it for two years. <laughs> <laughs> Naughty Ed. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but yeah, it's a lovely little community we got going on there now. It really is. It is a testament to how, you know, tight and compact Adelaide is. I feel like everyone knows each other and it's really clear and defined on how we can sort of get our feet into the music game. It's so I welcoming. think that, that really helped. Having such a tight-knit community really helped us mobilise very quickly because between the four of our five of us actually is Sam Trezai's as well. He's, he's, um, he's not usually there on the shows, but Sam's the guy who's done all of the graphic design and, and, you know, made it look as good as it does. Um, and, uh, just, you know, how quickly all of us were able to sort of pull on our resources and who we knew in what bands and everything and just make it happen really quickly was amazing. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, readily available resources for people who need. Yeah. I found um, when I uh, when I when I kind of first moved to Adelaide and started doing this this whole thing and started interviewing um, bands around the place, it was very easy mm. for me to to kind of just find someone to to film and edit and, and yeah. help me do it. And it was it was very nice, very humbling. Um, mm. Something that yeah, I'm uh, uh, very grateful for indeed. Where did, where did you move here from? Uh, so Queensland. Queensland. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a tight little scene and it's not very clicky as well, oh, which is nice. Uh, yeah, it's good. Like, doesn't matter what genre you're playing, what venues you play at, everyone's kind of, oh, you're in a band in Adelaide? Oh, me too. Like, it doesn't really matter. No one's competitive or anything. There's no drama. It's, it's amazing. No. no, it's very, very rare. <laughs> It's just, yeah, it's just everyone's about the music and yeah. how it should be. It's lovely. Well, what's good for anyone in a, what's, what's good for, for one band in Adelaide is good for all of us, you know, because we are, I guess it's, that's because we're an emerging city still. Definitely. We're not as big as your Melbournes yeah. or your Sydneys, that kind of thing. And sort of getting ourselves more established on the, the national map as a music mm. city is something we, you know, we all have a stake in that. Mm, mm, for sure. Um, mm. Yeah, but you know there are. I guess there are drawbacks of being in a small city because now half the venues are, are closing, and mm. you know, it's going to be yeah, probably be a bit hard to find gigs uh, after this. Probably, yeah. I remember when the Ed Castle shut, and then suddenly um, the Crown and Anchor is booked out six months in advance. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which but is having... great because you're compacting it and everything, and you're getting good turnouts. But it's yeah, it's getting harder to get a gig. Sorry, but having said that, though, um, the Jade actually is a good example because Zach campaigned mm. to get that uh, small venue license through. Um, mm. So I think there's definitely, you know, we have seen quite a few small pop-up venues come and go yeah. over the last couple of years. So, oh, yeah. um, so I, I think, you know, while it would be really upsetting to lose the, any of the venues that we love, I still think that there would be the opportunities for other people to, to jump in as well. But yeah. having said that, I, I don't want to lose any because I love them all. <laughs> I yeah, totally agree. Have, um, yeah. have, have either of you two heard of, I think it's Dad's Warehouse, a new venue that popped up? Yes. Uh, I have heard of them. I thought, yeah, is that like a, la a mini label or something? Or Yeah. yeah. Um, Lockie is actually a former student of mine <laughs> and oh, wow. he set up um, Dad's Warehouse as a part of his course. So, um, right. yeah, it's a performance space that is essentially in his dad's warehouse and um, he's started um, a small label with those artists as well to try and I guess he saw that there was a lot of sort of um, chill hop kind of rappy kind of stuff going on in Adelaide that mm. people didn't really know about. So he wanted to um, really... Um, promote that scene and those particular artists and he's been doing such an awesome job I'm super proud <laughs> yeah I have actually seen the Instagram and I, I watched a couple of it it's like a big it's actually a warehouse like yeah, yeah. yeah. and there was the, it's and the artists I saw in there I'd, I'd never seen them before I'm like where do these guys come from you know mm -hmm. yeah. and um, he's been doing a bit of stuff with playback 808 as well which is really mm -hmm. good to see oh that's cool nice oh, that's good one yeah. thing, yeah. Um, one thing, uh, w w yeah. One thing I'm hoping from this is that we see gigs happening uh, more outside of the city. 
Um, that would be nice. The Man, I live on Jetty Road and I miss the Jetty Bar so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days when I could just play a gig and walk up the street and go home. Like, and that was always like, oh, yeah. yeah, just getting gigs outside of the city is really difficult. Like, because yeah. it used to be what Jetty Bar, if for a touring act, for example, like you'd come mm-hmm. to play a show in Adelaide one night and then you do Jetty Bar the other night. Now it's like they can really only do one gig when they come here. Yeah. You know, it's, oh, wow, that's it's awesome. tough. Yeah. Like yeah, we had I've, a few, sorry, go on. Yeah. yeah. I've heard of a few um, pubs that have been toying with the idea of um, hosting bands. I, I saw mm. that Ramsgate were promoting something pre COVID. So it'll be really interesting to see. Cause yeah, um, there does seem to be like not as many in the suburbs hosting um, original live music. Yes. Anyway, there's quite a few covers, but um, not I've, as much original music. Yeah, I've played the Rammy in a previous act that I was in, but it was only for a couple of like bigger band supports. So that's that's all I've seen there. I think the Marion Hotel is starting to pivot towards original music as well and having a crack at it. Um, I've seen it happen a few times. There was a place actually, what was it called? Like it was down in Gawler. And this dude just like built a massive wooden shed and set up a full on stage project projector, lighting, visuals, bar, the whole works. And just, it was a kind of build it and they will come kind of, I can't remember what it was called now. It's just, I think it was something like the shed or something like that. And um, yeah, like pretty original, but um, it was really cool, but it was just such a struggle to actually pull regular crowds to original music that far away from the city. Mm. It's tough. It's really uh, tough. Yeah, I, I recently went down to to Port Adelaide, and I had a kind of, I had a little look at the venues they have there. Just a couple of small mm-hmm. ones, no, nothing really special. But uh, yeah, actually, I think I met you at the Port Admiral when Ghost Thief was playing. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Okay. I was yeah. I was wondering. I knew your face from somewhere. <laughs> that was it. We were on the balcony. I remember now. Uh, Ah, there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I very much loved that, that venue. Um, it was cool. And I know, yeah, they, that was kind of, yeah, they were kind of experimenting with getting live music in. Um, and I just mm. thought, yeah, if we can, it's so centralized in Adelaide um, and there's nothing, yeah, there's nothing really else outside of it. Um, you, I know, need, you, need, you need a booker. You need a really good booker who really knows what they're doing and it needs to be promoted well. I think one thing, like the, the, the best, I think the best thing we had that, that was close to, to having something outside of the city was obviously like the Jetty Bar. And that was going for a while. But um, because I lived nearby, I knew some of the staff there and I used to play heaps of gigs there. And the, they just sort of, I think they started cost cutting and the band bookings were left up to the person who was, this is, uh, I don't know, I can't confirm this. So don't, it's not like get, an exclusive insider inside thing. Cost, yeah, this is nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. But what, what, what I was getting was um, through my manager at the time from my old band was that the new booker was just the person who manages the Pokies Lounge. Wow. And they didn't really know much about promoting original music. And it just started going down from there. And like, sometimes there'd be a great band on, sometimes there would just be some really average cover band who'd just thrown their stuff together in the last week. Um, and it was just, you basically you send her an email and you'd be at the booking and you'd get the $400 guarantee. So it was just swamped with, it just wasn't, it wasn't done very well. And then the owner looked at it and said, Oh, no one's coming out to the gigs. Let's ax the gigs. You know, is that a, is that an issue either of you have come across um, regularly? You find bookers and managers who, don't really care about the music or care how it sounds or managers. No, absolutely not in the city. You have, I mean, in the CBD, you have to be good as a booker. Otherwise you just you're gone. Like that'll be the end of it. Um, I haven't met a manager who isn't passionate. Um, I can absolutely say that about my old one. Uh, but that's, that's the thing that's probably probably lacking. It's a different culture in the suburbs. Mm. You know, you've got places like the emu and stuff like that, who, you know, tout themselves as being music venues. This is the place you come and see bands, but it's nothing but cover bands. Um, like only cover bands and they, they do well, like they make money on that and it's cool, but y- you can market original music to those same crowds. It can be done, but you've got to be smart about it, you know? 
Mm. Yeah, and I think sometimes there's just a lack of awareness of how to approach original music in that context if they're not as familiar with that scene. Um, I know it's something that Music SA have worked on. Um, CN in particular um, worked hard Mm. on a a live music toolkit um, to help Mm -hmm. assist councils in um, how to answer these kinds of questions from from suburban and regional venues to assist mm. them to book live original music. That's great. Are uh, either, of, um, either of you two aware of Northern Sound System? Up in, up yeah, yes. 100%. 100%. 100% love their work. <laughs> the other uh, side, of, side of town for me, I haven't actually been there personally, but they're, they're doing a good job. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's a wonderful place. Um, yeah, great. They just got access to the second half of the building that was leased out to someone else, and now they're doing a big renovation. Uh, nice. They're going to be yeah, um, getting more live events on and 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 everything. Uh, and I just thought of how unique something like that is in the northern suburbs, where they're really totally. Is, there's nothing else that there's nothing else like it. There's there's no hub mm. music. There's no um, you know there's no pubs that play original bands. Um, mm. And it, and it's yeah, fun. they've got a beautiful community and uh, I think it's super important to the youth work that they do and how they incorporate their recording sessions and drop-in centres with um, yeah, all of the musical stuff that they do and the equipment yeah. that they've got and the staff that they've got. They do a really excellent job. Yeah, um, yeah. I was because I was thinking like if you go up, uh, I, I grew up, I spent like my very early years in, in the northern suburbs um, and yeah, if there's, there's really nothing to do, um, the, when you have something like NSS, it really keeps kids busy and it keeps them busy in a good way. Um, yeah, that's I, pretty important. Very much, I'd very much like more things like that going forward um, mm. into the future. Very valuable. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see because the, cause that kind of stuff, like to kickstart that kind of thing, you need some government funding or someone who's very generous. But um, we've recently seen with the whole, you know, um, pandemic crisis situation, there's been a lot of grant money getting thrown around. Um, And it'd be interesting to see, you know, what comes of all of this, you know, all these artists and projects and stuff that are, that are getting funded now because they're just injecting money into the arts community more than they have previously it'd be interesting to see what comes of that and if they then look at that in six months 12 months time and say hey that worked out really well we should keep putting money into the arts it might might be a good experiment to see you know what we can do when we've actually got funding definitely um kim yeah kim you're at obviously you work at music sa do you have any any knowledge you're allowed to talk about about the the funds and how they're kind of distributed um uh, yes and no, in that Music SA um, don't really um, administer, we don't offer grants. Um, we apply for grants <laughs> like other people. Um, so that would be um, the government um, part of, um, uh, I guess, the music industry, which would be the music development office. They run a lot of uh, grants for the music community. Um and they have recently announced new grants. Um, they did initially double their um, normal grant round, but I uh, it went saw up to seven hundred thousand, um, I think. Yeah, yeah. The um, the premier um, put in a whole heap of extra funding only a few days ago. So um, all of the details for that. If anyone is interested in applying for grants. Um, you can actually find links to all of the different various places from music development office um, to car clue who, if you're 26 and under, I would 100% apply for grants through car clue. Um, There's also some in um, Australia council for the arts, um, a whole heap of different places. You can find those links on the music SA website. If you hover over resources and the resources tab, you'll see a little COVID-19 page. Um, And we've actually summarized all the different places that you can go to apply for grants. Um, And, you know, I I have um, been, you know, I have written some letters of support for people for grant applications in the past and have um, sat on a peer panel for a um, grant with MDO. So, one thing that I would really, really recommend when it comes to 
applying for grants is read the criteria, um, read the things that they're going to be assessing against and address every single point with as much detail as you can. Um, including if you, for example, if you wanted to do some recording, reach out to the studio and ask them, hey, um, it, can we record with you? And if they send you a letter saying, yep, we've spoken, I'm happy to be involved in this project, that can go on the application and all of that will add weight to your application and make it more likely for you to get that funding. Um, so, yeah, do your budget well, um, plan it all out, think about what it is that you want to achieve, answer any questions in the application as thoroughly as you can and uh, that will help you put your best foot forward when it comes to applying for these kinds of grants. Yeah. Um, well, you've mentioned Carclu and a lot of grant sort of focus ways of finding your feet, but, you know, for a lot of young musicians and young artists in Adelaide, you know, 26 and under, they're finding their first feet in the industry mid-pandemic. Um, yeah. For both of you, how would you recommend young musicians and young artists find, you know, get a foot in the door mid COVID-19? Now is the time to record. <laughs> yeah, now is the time to record. No matter what kind of gear you have. I've got, I, I actually, like, I came straight from work. I teach kids drums. That's my day job. And I've just started encouraging every single one of them to make videos of yourself, record yourself. It doesn't matter how crappy your gear is. Start doing that because it's the next best thing and then show that to people because if you can't get up on stage and play in front of people that's out for now sweet that'll come back start recording yourself that's that's my advice straight up it's the best thing you can do yeah i would agree um recording as much as you can reaching out to like i know when i first started trying to write music and form a band i didn't even know who to approach to join a band and it's really just a matter of asking friends uh, to my surprise, several of them played instruments. And oh, I didn't realize that should we maybe like try something out. That might be fun. Um, so just getting started, um, writing lots, write lots and lots and lots and lots of music. Um, Cause the more you write um, the, you know, the more polished and cool it'll become and the more you'll find your own style and mm -hmm. um, find what, feels right for you um so yeah write a lot um record a lot um reach out to um to friends and colleagues and um and you know for when band bands do start playing again you know don't be frightened to you know send some demos out to some people and see yep. you know if it say hey i don't know if there's any openings on any support you know slots yeah. you've got coming up is there any chance i could hop on the bill you know yeah. those kinds of things to just get get your foot in the door totally now's the time to really polish up practice practice record and like i've been in bands where we've had um, people approach us for support and if you can spend some time making sure that you're you don't need to have you know over a thousand followers to for someone to say yeah i'd like you to open for us or whatever you just need you want everything to look good like you've put some effort in put some effort into your socials. If you want a website, make that look really good. And above all else, make sure your product's as good as you can possibly make it. If you've got video, if you can get some video footage of you playing and get an idea of what you're going to be like on stage, if you've got some good demos, like you said, that's a great thing to look at. You know, I've agreed to have bands play just because I thought that they were really putting some effort in. I'm like, these, these guys are going to go somewhere. But then there's nothing worse than getting something in the inbox from a half finished Facebook page and you've got no music posted up there and they go, Oh yeah. Can we open for you guys? It's like, I don't know what that's going to, I don't know what's going to happen if I say yes. <laughs> so, yeah. I, can, I, would, I would agree with all that. And um, yeah, always being friendly and professional with everything mm -hmm. that you do to put your best foot forward. So um, yeah, make your, make your music as good as you can make it. Mm. Have your photos look as you know nice as you can. Um, yeah, it doesn't need to be expensive. Sorry. Yeah, I said yeah. Get press shots. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it <laughs> is. Photo shoot. I love them. <laughs> I can I can definitely tell you both um, teach to cert, to a to a certain degree. You're very good at giving giving advice to to young people. <laughs> 
<laughs> Glad to Sorry, help. My cross. <laughs> Thanks, man. I was going to say that, that I, a thought I just had as well um, that, that you brought up there, Kim, because I was saying, like, you know, if you're sort of emerging, um, this is really tough because the way that I sort of got to know people, like all the bands that I'm in now, I met by being at gigs, being yeah, a part same. of the scene. You can't, you can't do that right now. Um, that's a challenge. You know, if you're really looking to start a band right now, I mean, the only resources I guess anyone would have is like you said, people, they know friends um, and just be ready for when you can get out there and start you could, talking. You could to reply bands. to people in the comments of the live streams, can't you? <laughs> you can do that. That works. Yep. Yeah. I'd love to see a band get formed in the comments section. Yes. That'd be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That'd and be I really think too, cool. It's a good time to do some research as well. Like if you know what kind of music you're writing and you are starting to do some recording, thinking about places that you might want to approach um, to help you promote it. Like, for example, if you do want to get played on community radio, have a listen and think about what shows in particular might be interested in playing your song. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly with bands, um, thinking of bands um, both locally and nationally that you might want to play with that it would seem like it's a good fit um so to just start doing that prep and that groundwork so that when we can get things ticking along again you already have a bit of an action plan in place of of how yeah. to do what you want to do yeah totally uh kim can can prospective bands send their demos to you and maybe have them played 100%. <laughs> you can send them to um, me if they want to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I can do for it. I'll listen to them though. <laughs> yeah, um, my, um, my 3D radio address is um, kim.roberts at 3dradio.com and 100% don't send attachments. Please send me a link to where I can stream and download your music. Um, but um, I would... I, I absolutely love it when people come to me for radio because it does some of my prep for me because, you know, rather than having to scrounge around and find people, they've come totally. straight to me. So I'm like, cool, <laughs> I will 100% listen to that. Do you, does 3D still take the old, like, physical CDs for the library as well? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we do. We've got an um, electronic um, catalogue now so we can yeah, add yeah. things in um, MP3 only. But yep. I know some announcers still still like the old CD. I think it helps having a physical thing. I remember like my, my, one of my old bands, we did like a single and we weren't going to do any hard copy CDs. Um, but there was uh, this show on Triple M, um, The Late Lounge with Tim Pine. I think if you know Clint Bryce, he, I think yes. he, does, he was working with that and he sort of gave a tip off that, the show was like interested in maybe having some original like local bands played on, on triple M. And so we just went like, Oh, well let's just get a short run of CDs made like five or 10. And I wrote a little note inside the CD and went into the triple M office and handed it to the receptionist and like, give this to Tim Pine and it got played, you know, like mm. I, I think having something physical like that and just approaching someone and saying, Hey, I'm in a band. I'd like to do this. Like you shouldn't be scared of that stuff. I've had people um, who are friends now, who were fans of, of my old band uh, who just sort of came up and started talking. And, and I didn't realize a lot of people are scared to talk to bands that are already established and playing around. And there's really like, I know quite a lot of them now and no one's scary or up themselves. <laughs> like we like it when someone walks up to us after a gig and says, Hey, that was good. How you doing? And like wants to hang out. It's a great thing, you know? talk to bands if you're if you're a, if you're a, if you're a newbie and you want to get established like as soon as you can get out there you know everything kim said for now absolutely get yourself ready but as soon as you can get out there just talk to the bands even if you're not playing on the bill just come up and chat most 100%. of them are really cool and then you become friends with them you're part of the network you're in the adelaide click and there's one big click here you know definitely i'd 100 percent agree with that That's, yeah it's, yeah it's, it's as easy as that it really is uh, well, for some people, yeah, it's uh, yeah, you got to push past that little wall of anxiety. Maybe a little bit of Dutch courage to help out as well. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, when, uh, Wednesdays at Cranker, you get a three dollars schooner. There you go. There you go. Cheap. That's not that, that, not not, no that we, not that we are promoting uh, our drink alcohol. responsibly, of course, of course, yes. But it can't be <laughs> understated that the music industry runs on alcohol. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's I that's a separate issue. Yeah, because mm, even things like riders, it's yeah. like payment in alcohol, which I think is a, a greater industry discussion that needs to be had at some point. That's for another podcast, hey? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, okay, we'll put, a, we'll put a cork in this and we'll come back to that subject at a, at a later <laughs> date. Um, uh, Otto, if there is nothing else you would like to say, uh, I'd like to thank Kim and Ed for jumping on. Jumping on Thanks for having me. This, uh, this pilot episode of, of uh, t- uh, I guess, podcast series we're going to do for a bit. Is this the pilot? Is this the first one? Yes. 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 Oh, lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks so much for asking oh, i super pioneer. appreciate it it's lovely <laughs> that's that's all right thanks guys, guys. Any, any absolutely oh, no, all right. you want to say not at all thank you guys for coming um five safe for you all right cheers Easy. nice cheers. to meet you Cam. i'll see you on saturday yeah we'll do i'll see you soon <laughs> right. Bye. Bye, thanks everybody Bye. see you